Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, fifth and final day of the Summer of Student and Aging. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much for uh, attending all week, for those who have attended all week. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for attending uh, over there on VTEL land, uh, from all the multiple sites that we we're broadcasting to across the nation. Um, we're so happy to be here and uh, to be uh, presenting these fine speakers today. Today we're going to be going over uh, the AGI, um, uh, nutrition and diet, addressing pain, uh, polypharmacy, uh, some more aging research with uh, Dr. Rochelle Buffenstein, and finalizing today with uh, recreation, recreational therapy uh, from a couple of uh, local VA employees here. So. Let me just go over some real quick housekeeping things. Of course, some of you, uh, most of you are from the VA, so you know where you're located at. Uh, I've been uh, brought to my attention that some of you have had uh, some difficulties with uh, TMS and filling out the evaluations. We want to ensure that everyone here who has attended gets credit for their attendance. So today I'll be contacting TMS and hopefully get some access to you by the first break or even by, by lunchtime to make sure what the issue is going, what, what the issue is with the uh, TMS and finalizing your evaluation so you can get your certificates for your attendance, uh, which is due to you. So I'll uh, try to give you an update throughout the day as to what the issue is and how to, uh, how to solve this and how to uh, make sure that you get your credits. <coughs> Again, if you attend, you're, you're due your credits, so that's only fair. Um, make sure that you have signed in today and make sure that you have registered uh, if you're non VA uh, through TMS, and of course, if you're uh, VA, make sure you've gone through the right channels and uh, attempted, uh, you know, to do your best and to fill, fill, fulfill uh, the TMS requirements. So it is uh, eight o'clock, and our first speaker is uh, Dr. Sandra Fox. She is a assistant professor and the director of the Lions uh, Low Vision Center of Texas. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Fox. You know, I know, I've been to these long conferences as a presenter and as an attendee, and the last day, it, it's like, man, you're just ready to move on, right? <laughs> so, you know what I think we need to do? Is I think, I think we need to dance a little bit. I don't know how to get this going here. <laughs> Come on, everybody. You can do it. Keep going. Stand up. I want to see everybody going. Come on. Everybody go. We gotta be happy because it's Friday. Oh yeah. It's Friday. Last one. You can do this. Everybody. My grandsons can do this. You can too. Pat them off. There we go. Melvin, you're not dancing. No, no, no. All right, that's good enough. I got some people up. All right, thank you very much. Now the boring begins. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I did. What we're going to talk about this morning is some of the vision changes that, that are normal and not normal in the aging population. And you know, this is really important because when you, whatever, whatever you do, whether you're a physical therapist or dental hygienist or a nurse, whatever you do in your clinic, you are going to have senior citizens, as you all know. And if you think about it, this is sad. I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> I'm like Mick Jagger up here. <laughs> so you need to be aware of what's going on with the vision, especially if you don't know what's going on with the vision. Think how much, our, how much of a role our eyes play in everything that we do in our lives. So, you know, if you're in a rehab setting and you're trying to work with a senior citizen that has macular degeneration and this person doesn't see very well, and you think, oh my gosh, this person has some real balance issues. You may not understand the reason they have balance issues is because they don't see well. So let's go over some of the things that you can expect and some of the things that you may not expect. 
I think we've all seen, you know, the basic picture of the eyeball. And we'll throw a few of these in, so I'm just going to cover this just a little bit. But it makes sense that when the way we see light comes through the cornea, through the lens, through the vitreous, back to the retina, where the optic nerve, of course, it lands right here on the macula. All these nerves collect in the optic nerve and go all the way back to the brain. Anywhere in this system, if there is an opacity that cannot allow the light to get through, you've got a vision problem. So really, when you study the eye, it's a, it's a wonder that any of us see. You know, it, there's so many things that can go wrong, and it's just a true miracle that we all see as well as we do. And, and I think one of the things that just I love about the eye is it's such a small little organ, but it is so complicated, and it brings us so much joy. And so that's kind of our job, Mel and I, working with people that are vision impaired, is our job is to allow people to continue to enjoy life in spite of losing some of their vision. So these are the normal changes that we're going to cover first. Um, and we're going to look at some of the major functions in the eye. Visual acuity, accommodation, visual fields, light sensitivity and glare, contrast, dark adaptation color, and then dry eye. These things can all have some normal changes as we get a little bit older. So visual acuity just refers to our ability to recognize detail. And we use the standard letter chart or number chart or symbols, whichever is most appropriate. Uncorrected visual acuity starts to change around the age of 50 as we tend to become more farsighted. So it's interesting. People that are nearsighted undergo lots of glasses changes early on in life. And then from about 20 to 40, their vision doesn't change very much. People that are farsighted go through their life without very much change, and then they hit their 40s, and suddenly they start having lots of changes in their prescription, which is why the LASIK surgery, the, ref the corneal refractive surgery, works so much better for people that are nearsighted than people that are farsighted. Because farsighted people, if they have surgery to correct their vision, their vision's going to continue to change. Whereas most nearsighted people, it, it tends to slow down and almost stop once they get to a certain age. There's also some small neurologic changes that can occur in our brain that cause visual acuity involving fast moving objects to decline. Now, where do you think that this is an issue for us as we get older? Driving. Driving, yeah. You know, that's, that's why you can't just look at someone's visual acuity and visual fields and say, oh yeah, they're safe for driving. Because if they have difficulty with fast moving objects, they're not safe for driving. So one of the things that I wanted to really stress is a drastic decrease in visual acuity is not a normal sign of aging. And that is really important because what happens is as seniors that do have a big decrease in vision may assume it's normal, especially because if you think about it, if you have somebody that's 80 years old, I, I, mean, I mean, there was a time when we couldn't correct for cataracts, where people went blind from glaucoma, where people didn't live long if they had type 1 diabetes. So in that patient population, they do know people that, that went blind at an early age, and they don't even really know why. So they may assume that it's normal when it's not. Um, accommodation is the ability of the eye to focus on objects at near. And so we all kind of notice that, depending on whether you're nearsighted or far farsighted, nearsighted people, it doesn't uh, happen to them as soon as it does with far-sighted people, but that's when you start noticing that you have to push things further out in order to see them. And the lens inside the eye changes shape. That's what allows us to focus up close. Children can accommodate like crazy. Adults start to have more difficulty, and it becomes more difficult again around the age of 40. It's very easy to correct this with um, glasses or bifocals or nearsighted people will take their glasses off and just read things without their glasses. Where this is an issue is with people that have been vision impaired all their life. Because children that are vision impaired do very well by just holding things very close and they can get that kind of magnification. Well, as they get older, they're not able to do that. And I've had patients show up in my office frantic because it seems like overnight they could not do that anymore. And, and it usually occurs to them maybe around 30. And so what they'll think is, oh my gosh, my, my, my disease has worsened. 
And, and it's really not. It's just that they've lost that accommodation, and so they need a little help. And the other population where this happens is with brain injury patients. One of the number one things that happens is they suddenly lose that ability to focus up close. So if you work in a setting, in a trauma setting, and you have a young person that has a brain injury, they may suddenly not be able to, to see up close. And again, it's easy to take care of usually with reading glasses. In brain injury patients, depending on the age, it tends to get better with time. Visual field refers to our peripheral vision. And the size of the normal visual field for, for most people is way out here. I and mean, you can hold your hands out here and I can see my hand waving. Well, that one I can see waving there. And so this is about a normal peripheral field. As we get older, it decreases by one to three degrees per decade. So that by the time people are in their 70s or 80s, their field may be a loss of 20 to 30 degrees. So again, if you can see out here, by the time you're 80, it's more like this. So again, driving. You know, our peripheral vision is what saves us from killing someone and from being killed in driving. And, and so we really have to pay attention to those visual fields. Glare is caused by opacities in the lens and vitreous that scatter light. Cataracts increase glare. So that's one of the first things people start to notice as the lens inside the eye starts to change. I mean, I, well, I noticed this a couple of years ago. I, you know, I, I do, I, I run, I hike, and I remember one time I was on a, on a hike and, and I was just really having a hard time with, with seeing rocks and things in my way. The sun was low in the sky. And I went like this, and what a difference it made. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm like my patients, I'm gonna to have to start wearing a visor, you know? It makes a huge difference. And so what we recommend is that we recommend visors, we look at filters, different things that will help people with glare. This is also a huge issue in patients with acquired brain injury. They become very, very light sensitive. And it's also an issue in a lot of our diseases. Patients with glaucoma and optic, and optic nerve disease will have a lot of difficulty with glare. Cataracts increase glare, and when they're removed, the glare goes away, but now people are very light sensitive because over time, the lens inside the eye was changing color and filtering out some of the light, and now, bam. My mom just had cataract surgery in both eyes, and, and thank heavens it, it all went well, and she is amazed at the colors how bright everything looks because it's such a slow process you don't even realize it's happening. So again what we do in our clinic is we look at different types of tints to determine what shade is going to work best for someone in different situations. Where this is also an issue now that, that we do so much on, <coughs> on um, computers. One of the nice things about some of the e-readers is you can control for glare and contrast. And so that's been a real beneficial tool for us, for patients that have difficulty with reading. However, on the computer, it can be a big issue because patients that have a lot of glare problems and don't, don't really know how to change those settings will need some help, and, and Melba's really good at helping our patients with that. So contrast sensitivity is the ability to recognize detail when it's very, very faint, like on a newspaper. I don't know how many of you know this, but you know, maybe five or six years ago, in order to save money, they started using less ink on newspapers, and so it's become fainter and fainter. And our seniors start having difficulty reading the newspaper because of, of the contrast. This does get worse with age. Um, and some of it's due to cataracts, but it, once people have cataract surgery, it's still an issue. And it's thought that it's due to a de decrease in the number of neurons in the visual pathway. Those yellow tinted lenses, I think some of you have seen them, they call them shooter lenses or driving lenses, can be very, very helpful with increasing contrast, especially on a cloudy day. Um, and then good lighting, we talked about this in the back. Melba, do you have any lamps in your car? Because they really need them in the back. They don't have good lighting back there. I said, Melba's usually carrying some around in her car. Um, but a full spectrum lamp is very helpful. Melba's gonna talk about that later, but I'm telling you, if we didn't do anything but have Melba go over lighting, we could probably help 50% of our patients. Maybe more. Uh, dark adaptation is the ability of the eyes to adjust to changes in light levels. So that's like when you, you're outside and then you go into a movie theater. 
or into a darkened room. As we age, we don't do that as quickly, and it may be due to changes in iris muscle function and pupil size and due to developments of some cataract or non-cataract opacities. One of the things that I notice with my older patients is they have very small pupils. And so when you go into a dark room, your pupil needs to get big to allow more light in. And that just doesn't happen as quickly as we get older. Ambient light needed for reading by people in their 60s is three times that by people in their 20s. And again, I started noticing that maybe 10 years ago, that you know, I like to read in bed. And I, and I had this little lamp, and I noticed I'm getting closer and closer and almost bent over underneath my lamp trying to get enough light in order to see well. You know, and that's a normal change. Wearing those transition lenses that turn darker when you're outside and lighter when you're <coughs> inside can be helpful, but a lot of our patients do better with these wraparound shades that you wear when you're outside and then you take them off as soon as you come in, and that really helps with that adaptation process. So our ability to distinguish colors declines with aging as well. Um, the, we have three cone cells that are responsible for all the colors we see, blue, green, and red, and they all three decline in sensitivity. Colors are less bright, and contrast between colors are less noticeable. So when you see a senior that's wearing rouge like a clown, and you know bright red lipstick, and the blue eyeshadow, who was that girl, <coughs> Mimi, that was on the show The yeah. Office? She was a little young for that, but you know, when you see seniors that they're like that, and it's because when they look in the mirror, it doesn't look that way to them. You know, and so frankly, I'm going to ask my family and friends to please let me know if I look like a clown when I go outside. And I think we owe it to them, unless they like it. You know, we tend to like it a lot on the office. I know, I was at a conference one time, it, and it was a senior, there were a lot of seniors there, and one of the guys came up to me and said, can you explain to me why it is that so many older ladies have blue hair? And, you know, a lot of them did. I don't see that as much anymore, but the truth is, it has to do with the way they view colors. When they look in the mirror, they didn't see it as blue. We, it's obvious to us that it's blue, but it was a different type of, of coloring that they used. So cataracts also can affect color vision. And that's one thing that I told my mom. She was a little nervous about cataract surgery. And I, I said, Mom, you're gonna, when, when you have those lenses removed, you're gonna be amazed how much you've missed. And sure enough, that's one of the things that happens. The other thing that can happen is dryness. And you know, a lot of my patients will ask me, you know, my eyes are so dry, is that normal? And yeah, it is. If we think about it, our skin gets drier, our hair gets drier, our eyes get drier. So tear production does decrease, and then we have fewer tears to keep the surface of the eye moistened. And then the other thing that happens as we get older is our eyelids get a little looser, and so they don't hold the tears in the eyes as well. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do. We have a lot more in our arsenal for dry eyes than we used to have. Punctal plugs, we can put these little silicone plugs in. Um, we even have dissolvable ones that we can put in, and then if it helps, we can put in permanent ones. We've always just had the over-the-counter artificial tears, but now we actually have prescription drops that change how the, uh, the tear common, uh, it's not combination. Um, Viscosity. Yes, that's a good word. It changes, it changes how the tears are made, and so that actually leads to a more permanent change so that the eyes are much more comfortable. Now these are some of, those are the normal changes that we went over. Visual acuity can change, peripheral vision can change, color vision can change, but those are all slight changes over time and, and are not really gonna adversely affect your daily functioning significantly other than you may look a little silly when you go outside with too much rouge. But these are the risk factors for true vision loss. Genetics or family history, accident, injury, poisoning, aging, unfortunately, high blood pressure, medical conditions such as diabetes, some medications, substance abuse such as alcohol, tobacco, and illegal drugs. I just saw something on the news this morning that the CDC did a study that found that 10% um, of fatalities in the working age population are alcohol related. I think that, that was, they were, pretty, they were pretty surprised by that. That's a pretty interesting, I didn't get to hear all of it because I was getting ready, but that'll be something to look at. 
So one of the things that I talk about in this talk is that, you know, there's things we cannot control. We can't control our genetics or family history. We can't control getting older. I don't care how much plastic surgery you have. You are going to, your innards are going to get older. Um, high blood pressure, sometimes we can't because we have the genetically predisposition, but there are things that we can do about that. Again, diabetes, I have diabetes and hypertension in my family, but there are things that I can do to, to make that not be an issue for me as much as possible. Some medications, we can't always change the medications that we're on, but I have an older sister right now that is having a, some horrible allergies to medications. She's been overweight all her life, and she's realized, you know, if I could lose some weight, maybe I could go off of some of these medications, and this may help me with this allergic response that I'm having. And then, of course, substance abuse. I mean, we know, we know what tobacco does to the eyes. So there are things that we can control. So this kind of falls into that category of you control the things you can't, and you, you just turn everything over to God for the things that, you, that you, you can't. What did I say? I think I got that wrong. You control the things you can. See, that was a Freudian slip. Because Melvin will tell you, I am a control freak. So I try and control the things I can't. <laughs> that was definitely a Freudian slip. That was my lesson for today. Mel is over here going, yep, yep, yep. I've been working with her for 10 years. She is a control freak. So there's, here's the big four that we're going to look at. Macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma, and um, diabetic retinopathy. Cataracts, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy are considered diabetic eye disease. So these are big in San Antonio. You know, we have a lot of diabetes in San Antonio. We have a lot of eye disease in San Antonio. We have a lot of vision impairment in San Antonio. Macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness and vision impairment in adults older than 60. Um, 1.6 million Americans over the age of 60 have advanced macular degeneration. And um, a little over 10% of Caucasians over the age of 80 have vision loss for macular degeneration. This is, this is a, a real huge issue for us. Um, what happens in macular degeneration, this is a normal retina. Beautiful, everything looks good. This is the optic nerve, those are your blood vessels. The macula is the avascular zone, so there's no blood vessels there, and that's a nice, healthy retina. I don't see a lot of those. This is macular degeneration. This little circle that is what happens in macular degeneration. For some reason, the macula dies. It just gets destroyed. We're not 100% sure what causes it. We do know that people who have vascular disease, such as um, diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, high cholesterol, they're more likely to get um, macular degeneration. And so we suspect it has something to do with blood flow. So that's where a lot of the studies are. So when you have macular degeneration, this little area becomes blocked. And so everywhere this person looks, they, they see a blind spot. And a way to simulate it is to put your fist kind of right at your nose. And everywhere you look, there's a blind spot right in the middle. You can still see all around the side, but you cannot see in the middle. So people with macular degeneration, these are the ones that will, you will not know they're vision impaired because they get around very well. They have their peripheral vision, they, they get around safely in their home, but they can't read, they can't recognize faces, and so it's often very difficult. Activities of daily living become very horrendous. What happens is they can't read, they can't recognize pe people's faces, so they, they, they start to become shut-ins. You know, they're embarrassed to get out, they're, they have difficulty with dips and distance and depth, so again, they're afraid they're going to fall, they have loss of color and contrast in here at the time of their life when they love to crochet, they wanted to be able to read. They just suddenly are not able to do any of these things at all. And if you don't know, you start thinking, well, what would you start thinking if you have an older person that suddenly doesn't want to get out anymore, acting a lot more anxious? What, what are some of the things you might think is going on if you didn't know they had macular degeneration? Depression, Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and, and so they get misdiagnosed. And guess what? They don't want to let their family know that this is an issue, especially if they live by themselves. So why, why would they, what's the reason behind that? 
the nursing home. You know, that is like, no, that is they, the nursing home. That's how they think about that. So they're scared to death, they're going to lose their independence, and their family's going to shut them away in a nursing home. So they don't let on what's going on. Um, cataracts are the leading cause. Yes? I was surprised how many people with an actor of the generation drive. Yes. You know, we will go, we, we can talk a little bit about driving. It definitely is a scary thing. And, and you know, again, it's that loss of independence, especially in a city like San Antonio where our public transportation is, is not the greatest. You know, for people that live in other cities, Boston, New York, where they have great public transportation, it's not as big of an issue. But in Texas, it's tough when you can't drive. You know, especially in the summertime, it's 100 degrees. You know, it's not like you're going to really encouraged to walk very far, especially if you're 70 or 80 years old. So it is an issue for us here in San Antonio. Cataracts are the leading cause of blindness in the world, but really shouldn't be a leading cause of blindness here in the United States. But they are responsible for about 50% of mild vision impairment. Uh, it is a clouding of the crystalline lens inside the eye. Anybody over the age of 50 has signs of cataracts, um, but we call them pre-surgical. I don't usually like to call it a cataract until it actually is affecting vision because it just freaks people out if you tell them that. People with diabetes is tw are twice as likely to, to develop cataracts and they develop them at an earlier age. So I've had people in their 20s that are diabetic with cataracts. Um, the effects on daily life is they have a lot of difficulty with glare and contrast like we talked about earlier and reduced visual acuity. What they notice first is they have trouble driving at night. That's where you, they first start noticing difficulties, is with, their, is with difficulty seeing in the dark. So this is what a cataract looks like. That is a dilated pupil, and that's a very dense cataract. So this person is not seeing out of that eye at all. We don't, you know, it's funny. We didn't used to ever see cataracts over about 20, 30 cataracts in the United States because cataract surgeons were reimbursed well, and, and because Medicare's rules were not as strict. So if you had 20, 30 vision, man, they were taking out that cataract. Well, Medicare does not reimburse well anymore for cataracts. And they also, the patient's vision has to be 20, 50 or worse. So that's why cataracts are responsible for mild visual impairment. We did a, a, a study about 10 years ago where we went around to senior apartment complexes and screened them for vision problems. And one of the things that I found were a lot of people with visually debilitating cataracts that were told by their surgeon that their cataracts were not right yet. Right. Nobody even uses that term anymore. So that tells me, A, they're seeing an old ophthalmologist. And, and the truth is that their cataracts were affecting their daily life. They couldn't read the paper. You know, they couldn't do the things they needed to do. But unfortunately, again, Cataract surgery is just not reimbursed well, and so they really do tend, they, they don't, they, they're, they're not chomping at the bit to do cataract surgery anymore. So this is a good slide because this is a, a young person that has a cataract, which is rare. This is what it should look like. It's totally black because you can see all the way back, and this is the, the eye with the cataract. And it just makes for blurry vision. And again, gradual. It happens slowly over time. So you don't even really realize it until, until it starts to affect your daily activities. There are 2.2 million cases of glaucoma that are diagnosed and just that many that are undiagnosed. And glaucoma is a progressive optic neuropathy that has a particular pattern of optic nerve damage that leads to a, a, a visual field constriction. We don't really understand glaucoma, to be honest. You know, I, I just started working. Uh, after eight years of working in our diabetic eye clinic, I started going back a few months ago working one day a week, and how much more we have in our arsenal for diagnosing and treating glaucoma in eight years is amazing. But we still don't know a lot about it. Um, it is, I, I think most of us think of it in terms of high intraocular pressure, but uh, many people with, with damage to the optic nerve don't have high intraocular pressure. So all we know, is this, the, this definition. It's a progressive optic neuropathy that damages the optic nerve and causes visual field loss. We're not 100% sure what causes it. Um, we do know that people with diabetes are twice as likely to develop it. 
um, is the leading cause of blindness among African Americans, three times more common than in, in whites. The effects on daily life is they have difficulty with reading and getting around because they have this very, very, very constricted visual field. And the sad thing about glaucoma is although we can't cure it, we can treat it. So if it's not diagnosed, then the more damage that has occurred to the optic nerve, the harder it is for us to treat to, to where it gets to the point where we cannot stop the progression. And this, again, the sad part about it is if it's diagnosed early, it's treatable, and we can keep the vision loss from occurring. But I see patients every day. I saw one yesterday, a gentleman my age, that only three years ago was diagnosed, and by the time it was diagnosed, he had significant vision loss. And they're having a hard time, despite multiple surgeries, he's, he's continuing to lose vision. So this is one of those diseases where once you hit the age of 40, you need an eye exam every year. Because it's more likely to occur as we get older, so after 40, an eye exam every year, and it's the only way to tell if somebody has it. And this is just a slide that shows, this is what we call the cup to disc ratio. This really bright white area in the middle, that's the cup, and then the larger one is the disc. And the thing that's hard with glaucoma, and most of these can be normal in someone, but they can also be glaucoma in someone, depending on what's normal for you. And that's another reason why it's good to follow, have the same eye doctor follow you over time. Because what's normal for one person is not normal for something else. So when you go to an eye doctor, what we do to determine glaucoma is you have to check the pressures, you have to dilate the eyes and look at the back of the eye, you have to do a test that's called an optical coherence tomographer that measures the thickness of the optic nerve, and you have to do pachymetry, which measures the thickness of the cornea, because that affects what pressure you measure, and you also have to do a visual field. All of those things. If all of those things are not done in somebody that's suspicious for glaucoma, you can't make the diagnosis. So these vision screens where people just check the pressure inside the eye and say you don't have glaucoma, they don't work anymore. So again, this is a picture of a glaucomatist. See that big white spot? It should not be like that in this person. And then it causes visual field loss that looks like that. And again, by the time you notice that you've got a visual field constriction, it's too late. Diabetic okay. retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in industrialized nations and people between the ages of 74 and 25. The retinal blood vessels break they leak, they become blocked. So just like diabetes affects the blood vessels everywhere in the body, it affects the blood vessels in the eye as well. And one, that's one of the good things about it is that that's how di diabetes is often diagnosed in San Antonio, is when someone comes in for an eye exam. The sad part about it is, if it's doing that to the eyes, it's doing that to the heart, it's doing it to the liver, it's doing it to the legs, it's doing it everywhere. And again, it's usually a little too late. We can get some neovascularization that occurs in the retina, and once that happens, it's really a dangerous situation because those blood vessels can break and lead to extensive um, damage. More than 5.3 million Americans, 18 and older, have diabetic retinopathy, and this is the scary statistic. One in every 12 people with diabetes over the age of 40 has vision-threatening diabetic <coughs> retinopathy. And I, Melvin and I have talked about this. Again, I joined this clinic again after being gone for eight years. And, I, and one thing I did notice is we're not seeing nearly as many. I'm telling you, when I was there before, every day I saw people that were coming in for their first eye exam after being di diagnosed with diabetes and they already needed laser. That was a daily occurrence. So I was telling Melvin, you know, it's really weird. Things have changed. The primary care doctors have gotten a lot better about referring those people quickly. And so now, in the clinic, I have to say, it's a much more pleasant experience working there because I see a lot of people that are coming in just diagnosed with diabetes, their, their eye doctor has referred them for a baseline eye exam. So more than half the people I see are just easy people. Oh, yeah, you're fine, keep monitoring your blood sugar, keep it under control. But I do still see people coming in haven't had an eye exam, and they already need laser. And it just breaks my heart when that happens, because it shouldn't happen, but it does. It doesn't happen as frequently, but it does. So this is what happens in diabetes. 
the blood vessels become very leaky, so you have all these areas where there's a little hemorrhage, but you also see these white areas, and that's where there was a previous hemorrhage, so that's exudative material. So what happens in the eye is that you get this Swiss cheese effect, so that everywhere there's a hemorrhage or everywhere there's exudative material, you have a blind spot. The sad part is, if we go back to my this picture, if this is the fovea right there, that person could have 20-20 vision and not even know they have this going on in the back of their eyes. And so that's what's damaging, is that they don't come in because they think everything is fine, and by the time they do come in, the damage is done. This is an example of the neovascularization, these little bitty blood vessels that are growing, and when those break, this is what happens. So you get a, a huge vitreous hemorrhage. And so once you have that, then the, your chances of significant vision loss are very, very great. The effects on daily life, difficulty reading and recognizing faces, they have tremendous increased sensitivity to glare, even before they have retinopathy. A lot of our patients with just diabetes will come in and say, I walk into the HEB and it just all looks white. So that's a very early sign. They have difficulty with distance and depth, loss of color and contrast, fluctuating vision, difficulty with diabetes self-care. These are our most challenging patients because their prescription changes constantly and, and because their, their diabetes self-care is something that is so often overlooked. I mean, think about that. We tell our patients they have to check their blood sugar at home, they're on insulin, and then they have poor vision. I had a patient that came in with really poor vision and he was, he was insulin dependent. And so I said, well, who, who um, draws your insulin for you? And he said, I do. And I went, how's that working out for you? And he said, oh, not good. I was in the hospital twice last month. You know, so imagine. One of the things we have to recognize with our diabetic patients is if they have to have an eye exam, they have to make sure that they can do all of these things for themselves unless they have someone at home. And even if they have a caregiver, most of them that have a caregiver, the caregiver's not there on the weekends. Who's drawing their insulin for them on the weekends? Who's managing their medications for them on the weekends? I've had patients at my diabetic eye clinic that couldn't see well enough, that because they couldn't see well enough, you, can, you know what they were eating? Sweet breads, because it was easy. They couldn't cook. So these are the things where, that you really need to see and think about with all of your patients is how how are they able to keep themselves healthy if they can't see well? Other causes of vision impairment that we're not really go going to go into with this talk is congenital ocular disease, retinal dystrophies, injury to the brain and eye, and stroke. And that's a whole nother talk. Uh, we don't really have time to discuss all that can go wrong in acquired brain injury. But uh, so many of the patients in the rehab facility have acquired brain injury because they've had strokes or they've had aneurysms, or they've had brain surgery. And that's a whole, whole nother animal. And unfortunately, um, that often gets overlooked as well. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about low vision, which just is, it's considered low vision when we cannot correct their vision through normal means. We can't give them glasses, contacts, we can't treat it, we can't do <coughs> surgery. Whatever we do, their vision is still not correctable. So what, when we talk about rehabilitation, what does that really mean? Well, according to Webster, to rehabilitate means to restore or bring to a condition of health or useful and constructive activity. Webster did a good job. That's a pretty good definition. It is the process used to train someone to be able to perform tasks in spite of a loss of physical function. And it is goal-driven, and it does require a multidisciplinary approach. I mean, that's anybody that's in rehab. How many people in here are in a rehab type setting? Well, I'm just, well then I'll, I'll just tell you what it's like. <laughs> what? <laughs> How many of you have friends, family members, patients that have to have rehab? And then we get a few more hands. So what we do really is in rehabilitate, is rehabilitation. And, and I'll tell you, that's been a struggle for us for the past 10 years because rehabilitation is different than conventional ophthalmology. And it's been a battle that we have fought for 10 years. It's a, a different approach, it's different numbers, it, it's, it's completely different. But it is what we do because in low vision rehabilitation, the physical function that has been lost or compromised is vision. 
And our goal is to teach the person that has lost their vision to be able to perform daily tasks with reduced visual function. So the analogy I like to use is if somebody has diabetes and they lose a leg, well, the first thing that happens is their insurance gives them a wheelchair so that they can get around. Then they're going to go to a rehab setting so that they can learn how to get in and out of their chair. They're going to see PT to get their upper body stronger, OT to teach them how to do things from their chair. They're probably going to be referred to counseling because this is pretty debilitating emotionally, maybe to a support group to be around other people. Eventually, they're going to get fit with a prosthetic device if they're fortunate. Then it's back to rehab to learn how to walk on this new device. And in the end, the person that lost the ability to walk is now able to walk, albeit a little bit differently. And so vision loss is exactly the same. But over the years, we have not treated it that way at all. At all. It's pretty much you give them a cup with pencils and sit them on a corner. I mean, that's how we have treated people with vision loss. We have not looked at it at all as, as a something, a physical function that's been lost, and now we need to rehabilitate this person so that they can function again. But that's what Melva and I do, is we give them back the ability to perform their daily tasks. So the, so the first step is to get the low vision evaluation. And the purpose is to determine the level of functioning vision. What vision do they have to be able to perform their daily tasks? Because you have to know that. And I have to say that even in a rehab setting, you need to know that. You need to know what your patient's vision is like before you start doing any type of rehabilitation, even if it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, whatever. Speech therapy, if you're going to have them reading. The ultimate goal of most people is to enjoy a high quality of life through mutually satisfying interpersonal relationships and meaningful contributions in a manner that allows them to value themselves and to be valued by others, family members, friends and neighbors, and society as a whole. Now, wouldn't you all agree that this is your goal for yourself, for your children? This is what you want out of life. Well, when people lose their vision, the first thing that happens is they no longer feel valuable. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They feel like they're a burden. And, and it's terribly um, difficult for people. I don't care what age they are when they lose their vision. They feel like they're going to be a burden. I had a little girl yesterday. That's in, she's a little girl that was adopted from China. They adopted her in March, this March. She did not know a word of English. I couldn't believe it. You should have heard that little girl chatterbox. She was a chatterbox. I would have never believed that she just came here in March. But here's how she was. In China, they told her that when she got to the United States, they were going to cure her vision. Well, that ain't happening. And I'll tell you, this little girl, she did not want to be a burden. She was six years old. It was sad but encouraging because this was the smartest little whip I had ever seen. I don't think I've ever met a kid like this before in my life. I will be talking about her for the rest of my life. She is so smart. I, I, can't, I wish I could think of some of the stuff she could say, but if a six-year-old thinks along that, those lines, can you imagine what a person feels like when they hit 65, 70, and suddenly they lose their vision? It's horrible for them. So we have to use this team approach to get them back to feeling like they're useful, like they, they have a purpose in life, and that's what we do. I told those parents, you're in trouble when she becomes a teenager. I can see the writing on the wall. I mean, they don't have a chance. So what do I do as a low vision optometrist? I assess the clinical visual functioning. I match the treatment options to the stated goals. It is a goal-driven exam, so I need to know what it is they want to be able to do. I do prescribe optical and some non-optical devices, but most of that is left to Melba. I ensure that the visual skills are successfully integrated, and I usually serve as the coordinator of the low vision team. So where, who else does this person need to see? To, to, of course, most of them are going to go to occupational therapy, but some need speech, some need physical therapy for balance problems. Many of them need to go to social services, like Division for Blind services. Most of them need counseling. Most of them need to belong to a support group. So I serve kind of in that capacity to determine what services they need. It is very different from a conventional eye exam because our focus is on what vision is left, not on how much vision has been lost. And that is a very different approach. It takes about <coughs> 60 minutes, as much as I've tried to cut it down to 45. I have not been able to do that successfully, just because there's so much we need to do. 
Um, you have to do an extensive history, it, it, including what it is the patient would like to be able to do and how did they get here. Um, then we have to perform all the functional tests to determine what their usable vision is, and then we discuss the rehab plan and determine what other research sources they need. And it's kind of hard to do in less than an hour, especially in a, in a very complicated case. So these, those are, these are the things I look at. Some of the same things in a regular eye exam, but they're a little different. So we do distance and near acuities, but we use these very large charts so that we're not just going to say hand motion. That doesn't give us much information. I mean, if all you're interested in is seeing people wave, then hand motion is a nice tool. But we don't want to just see people wave. We want to see what size print they can read, how far they need to be from the TV, and that kind of thing. These are, we need to do these visual acuities because we use them to qualify services for patients, as well as for disability. Um, we use numbers, letters, or symbols, whatever is easiest for them to use. And we always measure single letter and text because text is different than single letter. And that's why patients can get 20, 40 on an eye chart <coughs> reading one letter at a time but cannot read the newspaper. And so we, we do a lot of different testing that is done in a normal eye exam. <coughs> we also do retinoscopy, which is a, an objective measure of what the prescription should be. And I've got two sources, the old-fashioned way, which is really very good. And then this is called an autorefractor. This is a great tool for nonverbal patients, for, for children, for patients with dementia. So that's my very, 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 very expensive second opinion that I cannot live without. And, and it's the first thing we do, is we want to see if the visual acuity can be improved with lenses. Most ophthalmologists... You're okay. No, you worry. didn't do anything. Okay. You can Most ophthalmologists do not have the staff <coughs> that can refract patients with low vision because it's very time consuming. And so they just don't do it. And retinoscopy and, and autorefraction are, are ways that we can get this objective measure. So the refraction is the which is better one or two part. Most of us have had it done using this machine here, a varopter, but I tend to use um, this machine, which is again, a trial frame. And the reason that we use a trial frame rather than a varopter is because it allows us to make larger increments of change and the patient can hold their head however they need to hold it. So if they have macular degeneration and have a blind spot, it allows them to move their head a little bit differently. We check near vision um, using lens powers that are much strong, stronger than usual, and we want the best corrected visual acuity. We also do peripheral vision, as we talked about earlier, with using something very simple called a tangent screen. You can just bring this little wand, I don't think you can see it, there's a little white dot on the top, and you just bring it in until they can see it. This patient has a hemianopsia, so this is a great tool because it's quick and it gives me a great idea as to how they function and it's helpful for the family members to see what's going on with their vision. Because they're sitting there watching going, Dad, you can't see that? You really can't see that, Dad? And so again, if we have a patient driving that's got very constricted wheels and the family member is sitting there, it's a helpful tool. We look at central vision as well, because for patients with macular disease, that's going to be a big issue. So this is my central tangent test. And I sit behind them and I just shine this little, I do that with my little laser. And they say when they can see it. And with this eye, this person has a scotoma right in the center. Oh, this one didn't turn out well. This is a looks like a partial ring scotoma, but this really was a whole ring scotoma. And in a ring scotoma, we see that with our macular degeneration patients that are getting injections. And what happens is it preserves their central vision, but they have a donut-shaped spot that they can't see. So again, these patients may read 20, 30 on the eye chart and can't read the newspaper. And so we can pick that out on this type of test. We also have a much more sophisticated instrument called a micro-perimeter. It does the same thing. And what it does is it projects directly on the retina. So this is a patient where, where this red is, that is a blind spot. This patient can see all over here, but they cannot see there. So we have two ways of determining what their blind spots look like. Where this test is coming very handy for us is when we have one of these patients that has 20-40 vision, they would not normally qualify for services, but if we can send them this picture that shows they have that blind spot, it does qualify them for services. So it's been really a good tool. 
We look at color vision and contrast. Those are two other things that we've talked about. You know, color vision is important for tech for a lot of different short, um, hobbies, sewing, painting, um, also picking out your clothes. You know, I actually had to do this. I, I, I will admit this. I have a pair of navy blue pants and a pair of black pants that are exactly the same, and I cannot really tell the difference in my closet. I have to get under my lamp and I look at him and finally I said, what in the heck is wrong with you? Just put a big B on the tag in your blue pants. I put the big B with a, with a marker on the tag. Uh, Mel, I'm telling a story that you'll appreciate. I had to mark my navy blue pants on the tag with a big B because I could never tell if they were the blue or the black ones. See, that's a normal change. Not being able to tell the difference between blue or black unless you've got it in a bright light is normal when you get older. But it's easy, I'm telling you, just mark it on the, on the tag. It makes it really easy. Um, poor, poor contrast is very common with people that have vision loss, but it can be helped with tints like we talked about. I also look at the internal and external ocular health, but most of my patients should be followed by somebody else that's monitoring that. The main reason I do this is I want to see what's going on. Do they have something that has changed dramatically since they last saw their doctor, do I need to refer them to that? We make quite a few referrals back. We check, we, we check pressures, so we, some, we catch high pressures. A lot of patients get these intraocular steroid injections, and that can really elevate the pressure. I can see diabetic patients that have a new bleed, or a macular degeneration patient that had dry and it's now wet. So I think it is important for us to look at that. The, the demonstration of the optical devices is the goal-driven part of the evaluation. And so that's because we now, we, we know what the patient wants to be able to do. They want to read, sew, do woodwork, drive. We know what their functional vision is like. We know what their visual acuity is, their peripheral vision, their contrast. We have an idea where the patient is emotionally. I didn't really cover that very much, but we do a, a depression scale because we need to know where they're at emotionally before we can proceed. And so now the question becomes, what devices do we need to get to that patient? What training do they need to be able to perform their daily tasks? So this is where I refer them to the occupational therapist, and that is her job. She looks at the optical and non-optical uh, devices that will allow them to do what it is they want to be able to do. And I have to say that I have to remind myself constantly that my goal is not necessarily the patient's goal. And, and that is really important when you're in rehab, and that's a tough one. Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little driven, you know, a little controlling, a little type A, and so I just want everybody to do this, 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 and they, that may not, they may just want to be able to read their large print Bible, and that's it. And, and oh, I shouldn't say that's it, that's a big thing. No, no offense to, to that. In fact, most of our patients really do want to just read their Bible, and I'm always really thrilled when I can get them to do that. But they may not need as strong magnification as I think they need, because they're not going to be reading small print. And that's why what Melba does is so critical, because she really gets to do all that with them. She is going to address each goal with an emphasis on the goals that can be most easily obtained, like reading, and discuss those that may not be attainable, like driving. And that's something we learned a few years ago, that we cannot, we cannot ignore going over what's an attainable goal or a realistic goal and what is not. Because if the patient has a, an unrealistic goal and you don't address it as such and you get them to do everything else but that, they will still look at what you, what you did as a failure. They will not think their rehabilitation was successful. And the example that we use is, and this was a, one that happened, a patient that she wanted to be able to shop. She wanted to be able to shop. And so we got her a telescope so she could see the signs, you know, where's the bread. You, with a telescope, you can even read the prices that are on the shelf. We got her a device where she could read price tags. We, you know, owe them to help her get around. But guess what? She didn't have a way to get to the store. You know, we didn't address that you do have a way to get to the store. And since she didn't have a way to get to the store, that goal of being able to shop was not met. And so we, we learned that a few years ago that you really got to talk about goals. We do make all the referrals, and a lot of people are involved. Of course, the individual with low vision and family members is the most important person is the individual. Family members come second. Sometimes family members have to be asked to leave the room because they can kind of overtake the show. Um, eye care providers, optometrists, ophthalmologists, clinical low vision specialists, education rehab specialists, 
vision teachers, recap teachers, it's a whole group there. Social workers, we wish we had at least a part-time social worker on staff because that is hard. We don't we can't possibly know every every service that's available, although I can tell you Melba probably at, by now deserves to have an honorary social worker degree for everything that she does. Um, psychologists and counselors, we refer a lot of people for counseling. It's very debilitating when you lose your vision. Support groups, and then the human service allied health personnel as well. So it's a huge team that we use. So what I would like to do now, are there any questions, or do you want to do the questions at the very end? Oh, I'll take it. I just wanted to ask, is the VA, you work with the VA? Good question. <laughs> I will be joining the Poly Trauma Center in August. Yay. We did have a, a, a low vision program. Did you did. With Larry, I don't know if you Larry, I know Larry quite well. Larry's retired. Now we have Renita, which we love very much as well. It's interesting with the VA in that the, the low vision has always been outsourced. So they do the devices here, but the, the, all the evaluations are done outside the VA. I don't know exactly what my role is going to be. You know, I've learned a lot about the VA. I was sharing earlier. I joined. I don't know what I'm going to make financially. I don't know exactly when I start, and I sure as hell don't know what I'm going to be doing. Sounds about right. So, if I still take this job, it will be with eyes wide open. You know, I think I think they make the process so hard that. They don't tell you how much you're going to make because then by the time you go through all the trouble, you'll just take it. Oh, well, what the hell? I've gone through all this. <laughs> Is that right? But I am. I'll be joining the Poly Trauma Center. And so I will initially be working with brain injury patients. The neuro patients are my favorites. I, they have been ever since we started doing neuro several years ago. And I have Melvin to thank for that. Um, we are going to still keep the Lions Television Center going, Dr. Melanie Gonzalez has been working with us already for about the past year. Uh, we, we, I interviewed a lady yesterday that's awesome, and she's going to be joining us as well. So it, it's, it's going to still be there. I'm really hoping the VA has not worked well with our clinic. And I, I'm not sure why that is, especially because we have some awesome equipment, especially for working with great patients with brain injury, that they don't even have here. And so I'm hoping that maybe I'll be able to facilitate that somewhat. I'm a little worried about coming to the Poly Trauma Center because they don't have the equipment in the Melba part. <laughs> so, I mean, we have some great people, but the equipment is nice. We have some beautiful equipment for working with people that are brain injured. So we'll see. Um, we do see a lot of vets, let me say that. We see a lot of veterans, and we definitely refer. We love it. If we, we have on our intake, are you a veteran? Because if they are a veteran, we just turn cartwheels because they're going to get such help. Or the VA, the VIS program is awesome for our veterans. We love that. And I'm very excited to be able to, to join and be a part of that. And, and hope I just don't get beat down. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Do, can, do I introduce Melba? Yes, please. Okay, good. I'm going to introduce um, my my co-worker that I've worked with for 10 years. Melba started with me at the Lions Vision Center of Texas. She is an occupational <coughs> therapist. And I have to say that I can't even remember when Melba did not know everything that she knows now. Um, when she, her background is working with neuro patients, she was with us from the start. When I was in private practice and did low vision, I realized that there was a, a, a piece missing. I knew there had to be a better way. Because we would just give devices and, and you never knew if they could do them or not. And um, so it was, it's been so awesome to work with an occupational therapist that, that I couldn't do it without her. And I say all the time, and now we're going to show it's true, that um, I'm easily replaced. What I do is, is easily replaceable. But what Melba does is, is not so easily replaced. And I think that what, what, if you look at the tip of the iceberg, the low vision evaluation is the very, very tip. And then what she does is all that stuff underneath the water that, that is just so, so, so valuable. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Melba Pettis Andrews. And you know, what is it they say when we, we, we're acting almost like an old married couple, that's the sad part. 